Welcome to Compass Church at Home. I'm Ashley Sekrecki. It's so great that you're joining us for Church Online. Our prayer is that the next hour will both inspire and challenge you to deepen your faith. And now we want to take a minute to celebrate with a couple of people whose faith has been deepened to the point where they found new life in Christ. Let's rejoice with Jose and Brian, who recently got baptized at our Chandler campus. If you're interested in baptism at Compass, check out the baptism page on our website. Another thing we like to celebrate each week is your generosity through the Dollar Club and how it's impacted the lives of people within our church. This week's Dollar Club is going to a grandma who's caring for a new baby due to some unfortunate circumstances in the family, which naturally brought on some unforeseen expenses. But then she was also injured in a car accident and is struggling with the insurance settlement to pay her medical bills. As you can imagine, all of this has caused her a good deal of stress. But this financial gift will help with expenses and remove some of the stress she's been facing. The total of your Dollar Club gift is $3,000. And don't forget, you get to be a part of the Dollar Club when you put in just one extra dollar above and beyond your regular offering. It's really that easy. So be sure and give online or by text today. Over the last few weeks, we've let you know that we are changing the company that we use to help process our financial gifts. One reality of giving electronically are processing fees. We're switching to a company called PushPay. They have low process fees for churches, and as a bonus, it's super easy to use when you're giving your offering. An essential part of this transition is having you set up a new giving account with them. If you haven't done that yet, be sure and take care of that soon. It's super simple. Just text Compass AZ or Compass Casa Grande to 77977, depending on the campus that you usually attend. You'll get a link back that will walk you through a few simple steps. And as always, thank you so much for supporting the work the Lord is doing here at Compass. And finally, if you're new to Compass, we are so glad you're watching. If this is one of your first times with us, please let us know about it. Just give us a thumbs up in the comments and one of our online hosts will connect with you so that we can get you a special gift. And if anyone watching has a special prayer request or need, please let us know about that too. We'd really love to support you in prayer. Next up, our worship team will lead us in a few songs. And then after that, I'll be back to help lead us in communion. So be sure and get your bread and juice that you'll need for that. Then we're gonna be concluding our Fresh Prince sermon series with a great final message from the life of Joseph. But first, let's kick things off with worship. Hey, welcome. Come on, let's stand and we're gonna sing some songs here together. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Immense empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Come on. And you came along. God of the valley And there's no 
the war is over. The war is over. Turn around. Lay your weapons on the ground. The smoke is fading before the light. The dead are coming back to ready. Each week here at Compass, we take time to come together as a group of believers to partake in the Lord's Supper. We take the bread, which represents Christ's body that was broken for us, and we take the juice, which represents the blood that Christ shed for us on the cross. 
And as we partake in these elements, we're really reminded of so many things. One of those is the great price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. Jesus paid to secure our redemption and the tremendous forgiveness that's extended to us. Forgiveness that if we're being honest, most of us, me included, probably don't deserve. Sometimes when I really stop and I think about the grace that I'm given daily by Christ, it really overwhelms me just how freely he offers forgiveness to us with absolutely no strings attached. Oh, to be so like Christ that we can offer that same forgiveness to others that have wronged us, even when we don't think that they deserve it. So today, as you take communion, would you take some time to just remember the greatness of Christ's forgiveness? I just pray that you too would feel so overwhelmed by the grace that he just so freely extends to each of us. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for what you did for us on that cross. I thank you for the forgiveness that you offer to us so freely. We can go about our daily lives knowing that there is grace extended to us time and time again when we make mistakes. And that is just such an amazing thing to think about. Lord, I pray that we could be so like you that when we feel hurt or it's hard to forgive somebody that we could extend grace just as freely as you extend it to us. We love you, Lord, and we just thank you for what you did for us that day on the cross. In your name we pray, amen. Hey everybody, welcome to Compass Church at Home. I'm Jesse Vaca. We're so glad that you joined us today for worship. Now, Nelson Mandela once said, the struggle is my life. Now just stop for a moment and think about that line, the struggle is my life. Now if you know Mandela's story, you know just how true that statement was for him. And for those of you who might not be as familiar with him, let me just give you a quick snapshot. You see, Mandela spent many, many years fighting against apartheid, racial injustice, segregation, and violence in South Africa. And then he was ultimately arrested in 1962 for conspiring to overthrow the oppressive government. He was sentenced to life in prison. But then something miraculous happened. On February 11th, 1990, Mandela was released from prison after nearly three decades of incarceration. And then just four short years after that, something even more miraculous happened. He was elected as president of South Africa, the country's first black head of state, and served in that role until June of 1990. Guys, Nelson Mandela's story is incredible. It shows perseverance, strength, conviction, and courage. But just imagine for a moment how crazy his, my, his life must have felt like at times. I mean, he went from prison to the presidency of his country in four years. That's an amazing shift of circumstances. Now, maybe you've already jumped ahead and you've connected how Mandela's story really connects with what we've been studying over these last few weeks. You see, we've been learning from the life of Joseph in the Old Testament what it looks like to trust God with the darkest parts of our stories, understanding that we don't yet fully see the whole picture. We've seen the reality that God's always working behind the scenes to bring about his purpose for our lives and to turn everything, even the suffering in our lives, around for our good and for his glory. Now, if you haven't been with us throughout this whole series, let me just bring you up to speed on Joseph's life so far. Now, when we first meet Joseph, he's a young man with a unique gift to receive dreams from God and then interpret those dreams to find God's will. Now, he naively and maybe even arrogantly, he shares those dreams of grandeur with his family. In fact, one dream in particular that he shares it is about his dad, his mom, and his brothers all bowing down to him. Now, needless to say, that didn't go well for our friend Joseph. In fact, it went so poorly that his brothers ended up taking his dad loves me more than you coat of many colors and tearing it all up. They throw him into a pit. They consider killing him for a while, but then instead, they choose to sell him into slavery to a traveling group of Egyptian traders. Now, at this point, it seemed like this was the end of Joseph's dreams. Seemed like it was the end of his story. But what we discovered is that sometimes God's plan takes longer to develop than we anticipate. 
Now, during his Egyptian captivity, Joseph grows in both wisdom and leadership. He probably becomes more self-aware and more humble, and he finds himself again receiving great responsibility, this time in the house of a highly influential Egyptian leader. But again, these circumstances of his life, they start taking a turn for the worse. You see, after rejecting the advances of his master's wife, Joseph finds himself falsely accused, his reputation ruined, guilty without trial, and thrown into prison. Now, he was faithful to God and to his convictions, but he still finds himself and his life in shambles. Now, let me just stop here for, for a moment and ask you, have you ever felt like your life has gone like that sometimes? I mean, maybe you weren't falsely thrown into prison, but has your life ever felt like a series of missteps and mistakes? Well, last week, our buddy Joseph, in a similar strange turn of events, he's freed from prison, and he's promoted to a position beyond his wildest dreams. He finds himself in charge of the nation's food supply during a worldwide famine that threatens to wipe out the entire region, including the nation of Israel, which is where he's from and where his family still lives. And so now finally, after years and years of ups and downs, God's plan is finally becoming evident. You see, God intends to use all of that wisdom and all of that leadership that Joseph had gained through those trials and experiences, and he wants to bring those to bear to make a difference in the world. And guys, Joseph doesn't disappoint. He uses those years of plenty, those, those years of fantastic harvest to prepare for those years of famine that were still on the way. So much so that, that Egypt, the whole land, it's prospering. There's grain everywhere. Now, word gets out during this global famine to those surrounding nations that anybody can go and buy grain in Egypt. And guys, this is really big news because everybody's completely out of grain. There's, there's none left. Now, this is where we find a surprising twist to our story. Listen to what we read in Genesis. It says that when Jacob, now remember, Jacob is Joseph's dad. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? Now, I just wanna stop here for a moment, do a little quick side note, because I think that this is hilarious. Uh, Joseph basically looks at his sons, and he says, what are you guys still doing standing around here staring at each other? Why don't you go out and figure this mess out? Well, listen, he goes on. He says, I heard that there is grain in Egypt, so go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. So then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. Now, guys, don't miss what's going on here. These brothers, that's the family that literally threw him away. They tossed him into a pit. And these guys are now the ones who were coming to Joseph's new home to try to find food. These are the same 10 guys that threw him in a pit, the same 10 that sold him into slavery when he was only 17, and now he's almost 40. Guys, this is a tense situation. It's obvious that God's up to something now, maybe for us, we're thinking to ourselves, hey, maybe God's setting them up so that Joseph can finally pay them back, right? I mean, think about it. What do you think Joseph would do? Or maybe the better question is, what would you do if you were Joseph? Maybe we think to ourselves, finally, Joseph can repay these guys for all the evil that they've done to him. Finally, he can have his revenge. I mean, let's face it, that's how many of us would respond, isn't it? I mean, we'd want payback. We'd want someone to suffer for the consequences of their past mistakes. Well, let's look at what happens next, starting in verse six. It says, when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them and he pretended to be a stranger and he spoke harshly to them. Aha, this is it, right? This is the moment, here we go. Joseph's finally gonna get his revenge on his horrible brothers. Well, not so fast. You see, as we near the end of Joseph's story, we find him in a position to take revenge against his brothers. But he doesn't. You see, in the rest of those chapters 42 through 44, Joseph tests his brothers time and again to, to kind of start to determine their character. And then finally, Joseph is so convinced that they've changed, so convinced that, that they're not who they used to be, that he's ready to reveal his real identity to them. And, and listen to what happens. It says Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and so he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. 
So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and even Pharaoh's household heard about it. Now Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still living? But his brothers weren't able to answer him because they were terrified by his presence. Guys, this is a huge moment for Joseph. It's huge. It's so huge, in fact, that he sends everybody else out of the room because this big reveal was only meant to be experienced by the family. Now, guys, this text suggests that Joseph was so moved by this experience and this encounter, by his brother's presence, that, that he literally started to weep. And because of his position in Pharaoh's household, uh, they actually heard him weeping, which means that, that they may have been nearby. This demonstrates how close to power Joseph had come. And so finally, Joseph, with tears in his eyes, getting ready to tear down his fake facade, he speaks to his brothers in Hebrew. He identifies himself as his long-lost brother. And the first question he asks them, is my father still alive? Guys, can you imagine being Joseph? Wanting nothing more in the world than to see your father one more time. Can you imagine being those brothers? I mean, they were terrified. They, they were probably horrified by what they had done. They were shocked by the fact that he was still alive and standing before him. I would guess that this is the moment in the story where they might have needed to change their clothes because that's how shocked and how unbelievably amazing this moment was. Well, listen to what happens next. It says that Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. Now, can you even imagine asking these guys to come close? Now, when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Now it's worth pointing out here that there's two likely reasons that Joseph asks his brothers to come near. Uh, first of all, it's because they were terrified and he wanted to reassure them. But even more importantly, by having them come close, it allowed them to verify his identity, to see that this actually was their long lost brother. Now once those brothers are, are close, he tells them the most amazing thing. He says, and now, don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land and for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to, pre to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all of Egypt. You see, guys, Joseph is trying to reassure his brothers by showing them that there's a bigger picture. And that bigger picture starts to make sense of their betrayal. In fact, Joseph says three times that God sent him. And so while his brothers are the ones that committed this awful sin by selling him and conspiring to cover it up, Joseph realizes that there's something else happening. Something bigger is at work. God is at work. Now, understandably, Joseph's brothers are still sick with guilt. They have a hard time believing that, that Joseph, whom they had so clearly wronged, can live without trying to get even for what they'd done to him. They're so worried, in fact, that they make up a story to tell Joseph they tell him that, that their father has kind of issued a command that Joseph should forgive his brothers. But guys, Joseph isn't interested in that story. In fact, he wants so badly to make peace that he goes on to plead with them, saying, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Now, let me just point out here that this is a rhetorical question that actually has two meanings. First, remember Joseph's position. He's the second in command to Pharaoh, and pharaohs were considered gods. And so there's a chance that Joseph could have some right to claim divine authority. Now, even as the second in command, pharaoh's right hand, Joseph also had the full authority to act and to speak on behalf of Pharaoh. And so what's interesting here is Joseph is demonstrating that he understands fully that he's not divine. He recognizes that he's an instrument of God, but he's not God. Now, the second meaning to this question is that Joseph understands that justice belongs to God. He doesn't feel the need to exact justice or punishment on the sins of others. He doesn't need to condemn them because he knows that God's got it all under control. 
Now, one of the most amazing statements that Joseph makes during this entire ordeal is actually found in chapter 50. Joseph says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Guys, don't miss this. This is so rich. You see, in this verse, Joseph recognizes that there's a greater story at work. And so this evil that his brothers had perpetrated on him was being used by God for a good purpose. That's amazing, isn't it? Guys, Joseph forgives. He even blesses and cares for those brothers who'd done such evil things against him. But I wonder, do you understand that God has chosen you? Do you understand that all that harm that you've experienced throughout your life, that God intends that for good, that he intends it for the saving of many lives? As a lot of us, if not all of us, we've been wronged. We've been hurt by someone who was close to us at some point in our lives. And honestly, for some of us, and we're still carrying around the hurt and the pain and the brokenness and the burden that that hurt caused. Listen, I know it's not always easy to forgive, But as we just saw in Joseph's story, we can't experience true freedom and salvation that God wants us to have until we allow real forgiveness to be a part of our lives. Now, I believe if we pay close attention to this story, we can learn some important, life-changing lessons from the life of Joseph. The first is this, even when God's silent, God's not indifferent. Now listen, no matter what has happened in your life, good or bad, it's not the end of the story. That's really profound, so let me say it again, and this time, really listen to those words. No matter what happens in your life, good or bad, it's not the end of the story. Guys, do you know that God is writing a story with your life? I mean, this was certainly the case in Joseph's life. I mean, think about it. All throughout this journey of ups and downs, of of tragedies and triumphs, Joseph always stays faithful. He stays faithful to God. He holds faithfully on to God's promises, those dreams that God had given him, and the belief that God was with him no matter where he was or what was going on. In fact, there's there's a number of verses throughout this story that say things like the Lord was with Joseph or, or the Lord gave Joseph success in all he did or while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him and showed him kindness and granted him favor. Now, don't miss that last one. It's so important to us today because even in prison, even during those times of difficulty, of suffering, when those moments seemed bleak and hopeless, God was with him. Guys, Joseph's story demonstrates to each and every one of us that God is with me. God's with you. God was with you when she filed for divorce. God was with you in the darkness of addiction. God was with you when your financial life came crumbling down all around you. God was with you when those doctors told you the horrible news. Guys, Joseph's story shows us that no matter how deep the pit or how hopeless the situation, God is always there. God's always with you. Now, the second thing that we can learn from Joseph's story is that even when we face adversity, how we respond matters. Now, here's the thing. How we respond to adversity matters, but at the same time, how we respond to prosperity matters just as much. Now, hasn't it been amazing as we've walked through this story to see how Joseph responds in each and every life circumstance and situation? In the midst of some of the most horrible circumstances, being abused and sold by his brothers, falsely accused of sexual assault, thrown into prison and forgotten for two years, Joseph still responded in a faithful, God-honoring way. And that's an inspiration, isn't it? It's incredible. Now, for most of us, we, we know pretty well that people don't respond well to adversity, but we'd like to believe that people typically respond positively or faithfully when life's going well. But guys, I don't actually think that's as common as we'd like to think. Now, consider this. We all know people who've clearly been blessed by God, who, but those people still choose to take credit for their own blessings or spend everything that they have on themselves. 
right? We know those people who choose to not help others or choose to not build up God's kingdom, but instead spend their entire lives building up their kingdoms. Guys, that's not what Joseph does. He does the opposite. Joseph stayed humble. He continued to not just give God credit and God praise, but to also use his wealth, his power, and his position to bless and save others. So let me ask you today, how are you choosing to respond to adversity in your life? And on the other hand, how are you choosing to respond to prosperity? Now, there's a third thing that we can learn from Joseph's life, and it's this. Even when it doesn't make sense, forgiveness is always the right answer. Now, I wanna take some time here. I wanna kind of camp out here for a while because this is a huge part of Joseph's story. Now, throughout this story, we learn that forgiveness really opens the door for us to see what God has in store for our lives and to really experience God's salvation. It's, it's kind of key to what God's doing. But let's just be like, honest and human for a moment. We all need forgiveness, don't we? I mean, at some level, don't we all desire, deeply desire to be forgiven? You know, there's actually a great story I heard about this very thing. It's a story from Spain about a father and son who'd become estranged. And things in their relationship had gotten really bad. In fact, so bad that the son ran away from home. Now, the father, he wanted to mend the relationship with his son, and so he set off to find him, and he searched, and he searched for months, but he just kept coming up empty, never able to track down his lost boy. But then finally, in a last-ditch effort to find him, the father put an ad in a Madrid newspaper, and this is how the ad read. Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office on noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you your father. Now guess what happened? That Saturday, over 800 people named Paco showed up, all looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. Guys, we all need forgiveness. And I'm not talking about obligatory forgiveness. I'm not talking about empty platitudes. I'm talking about heart healing, life changing forgiveness. And think about this, in light of all that God has done for us, all that he's already forgiven, why in the world would we choose to not forgive others? Now, maybe for a lot of us, it, it would have made sense for Joseph to make his brothers pay. It, it would have satisfied our collective desire for punishment for the guilty. But in the story of Joseph, we see a man who's come to a point in his life that he's able to say, I forgive you to those people who'd so wronged him. Listen, for some of us, we're just not there yet. And, and I get it. We've been hurt. We still carry those scars. We just can't seem to get those words out. If that's where you are today, let me just encourage you. You see, Joseph's life shows us that you can get there. Now, it took him 22 years of faith to get there, but he still got there. And hear me on this. You can get there too. But for others of us, we've been so weighed down by anger and, and bitterness and resentment for so long that we're just ready to let it go. We're ready to forgive, but maybe we just don't know how to even start. Well, listen, no matter where you are today, there's something important I need you to understand. If you refuse to forgive, you're in bondage to that unforgiveness. You're a prisoner to it. And that bondage, man, it, co it colors everything in your life. It, it colors your attitudes, your actions, everything. Now, in his classic, our, uh, classic work, The Art of Forgiving, Dr. Lewis Meads says that forgiveness isn't about trying to make things easy for those who've offended us. Instead, it's about pulling the knife out of our own gut. You see, resentment is like a pair of handcuffs that handcuffs us to those people for whom we feel resentment. He actually goes on to say that the word resent means to feel again. And so if we're holding on to resentment, it means that we're choosing to feel again and again and again the pain from our past. And so forgiveness becomes our way of freeing ourselves from that bondage. Listen to this amazing quote. He says to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that that prisoner is you. Guys, the thing is, 
Jesus knew this. He knew that we needed to forgive. And that's why he said things like, we should forgive 70 times seven. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, he taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, I know that some of you are sitting there thinking to yourself right now, like, listen, pastor, I'm just not gonna do it. I I don't want to forgive. And guys, this is the heart of the issue. Sometimes we just don't want to forgive. We don't want to let go. That pain is too much. Our desire for revenge is too overwhelming, and so we just don't want to forgive. But the truth is, remember how much God has forgiven us for. How can we hold unforgiveness in our hearts towards anyone else in light of the forgiveness that we've been offered? Now, maybe for you, it's not that you don't want to forgive. Maybe you think to yourself that whoever wronged you doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And guys, that's the problem with mercy and forgiveness. The only person to whom we can show mercy is a person who doesn't deserve it. There's actually a story about a mother who came to the Emperor Napoleon on behalf of her son who was about to be executed. And the mother asked for the ruler to issue a pardon on behalf of her son. But Napoleon pointed out that it was the man's second offense and justice demanded death. The woman replied, I don't ask for justice. I plead for mercy. The emperor objected, but your son doesn't deserve mercy. Sir, she replied, it wouldn't be mercy if he deserved it and mercy is all I ask. Don't you know that her son was granted that pardon that day? And because mercy can only be granted to those of us who don't deserve it, it's so much easier to accept mercy than it is to offer it. You see, when I experience mercy, I know that I have nothing else to lose and everything to gain. But then what happens when when someone sins against us? Well, listen, let me be clear. When I say that we need to forgive them, I'm not saying that you release them from all accountability for their wrong actions. That's not what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness isn't about releasing them from accountability. Instead, it's about recognizing that I'm not the one who holds them accountable. God is. You see, forgiveness is our way of putting those wrongs into God's hands and letting him sort it out because he's the only one that understands it all anyways. You see, we're not designed to hold on to unforgiveness in our hearts We're not built to keep that inside. Instead, it takes strength to let it go. And so understand that forgiveness isn't a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Now, theology professor Doris Donnelly writes this of forgiveness. She says, to err is human and ordinary. To forgive is extraordinary and and divine and uncommon and, and, uh, and not instinctive. In fact, forgiveness runs precisely counter to our instincts. It tugs us beyond the place where we would want to declare our pain, nurse our hurts, and invoke empathy. It encourages us to give more than we plan to give or thought ourselves even able to give. And so how do we begin to break out of the bondage of unforgiveness? Well, the answer is simple and yet sometimes incredibly difficult to live out. We need to forgive. And today, I wanna give you a really practical way that you can begin the process of forgiveness. In a moment, I'd like, to take, I'd like to ask you to take a second and grab a piece of paper and a pen. And on one side of that paper, I want you to write down everything that God has forgiven you for, everything that you can think of, write it all out. And then on the other side of that paper, I want you to begin to, to write down some names of people that you know that you need to forgive. And then as you go throughout this week, I want you to keep that paper with you in your pocket, somewhere hidden and safe. And and I wanna challenge you to look at that paper every now and again and just pray for those people on that paper. That's it, just pray for them. Every single day, pray for those people that God wants you to forgive in light of the forgiveness that you've been offered. And guys, listen, here's the thing. Here's the thing that we've gotta keep in mind. This isn't gonna happen overnight. It's probably not gonna happen in a day. It may not even happen in a month. But if you're struggling with unforgiveness, this is one of the best ways that I can think of to begin to break those bonds and set ourselves free. Guys, we're a family of forgivers. God wants us 
to forgive others. I want to leave you with this quote. Forgiving someone can't change the past, but it will change your future. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, I come before you now on behalf of each and every one of us who are, who are listening to your word and, and hearing this message, God. I pray that you give us the strength and the courage to begin to forgive. God, I know it takes time. I know it's a process. I know it doesn't happen overnight, but God, I know also that you have called us to be those who offer forgiveness. And so Lord, help us to be faithful to that call. Lord, bring to our minds every day how much forgiveness we have been offered. And Lord, challenge us every day to offer that forgiveness to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, hey guys, thank you so much for being with us today. Remember here at Compass, we do three things. We love God, we love people, and we share Jesus. Have a great week.